We're in a series looking at the Holy Spirit. We've just spent uh, a few months looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And um, today we're, gonna, we're changing tack and we're going to begin a few weeks thinking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And they're very different things. In order to help you understand the fruit of the Spirit, you've got to think completely differently to how you understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So if we go right back to the beginning, we're told in Genesis that God, God made man in his image. Mankind, male and female, God made them in his image. What, what's that about? What it's about is God saying that even though he is ruler of heaven and earth, he chose to create some beings who, could, who would live on the earth and would somehow represent him. That when, pe- that when the rest of creation would see them, that they would be reminded in some way of God and what God is like. Which is why some of the phrases that theologians use to describe humans is that we are co-regents with God, that we are called to reign with him, or if you like, on his behalf, that by the way we are, we are to demonstrate what God is like. So in that sense, the people look at us, one another, we look at one another, there should be a reminder of, oh, that's what God is like. Oh, yeah, because the way I've just been loved by someone, it's reminded me of what the love of God is like. When I meet someone full of joy, it reminds me of the fact that God is joyful. Did you know that God is joyful? I think that, that takes some people really getting their head around. There's all kinds of things that go on in people's minds around that for all sorts of reasons that I'm sure we'll get into in the coming weeks. When you're around someone who's full of peace, it should be something of a reminder, the peace of God. So God's strategy for the good of the planet is people made in his image. It's not programs. Please hear that. God's strategy for the good of the planet is people made in his image. Now, nothing wrong with programs and projects, but it's not the heart of God's plan. God's plan is men and women who reflect something of what he looks like. Of course, it all went wrong. When Adam and Eve mistrusted God, listened to the serpent, ate the fruit, they fell. And so the Bible uses phrases like they fell from the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That the glory that we're made for, that the majesty that we're made for, is being ruined in some way. So though you can still see what was, it's not what it was. A bit like if you were to go and visit a very, uh, a very regal old house that's been derelict for a few decades. You could look and go, I can see what it was. I can see the majesty that it was. I can see, I can see what it was once like, but it's not like that anymore. It's covered in weeds. It's covered in cracks. It's broken. But you can catch something of the splendor. That's the way the Bible sort of describes humans now. That, that when people do amazing things, you go, I, get, I can see the splendor. I can see what was. I can see what God had in mind. But there's so much damage and darkness and pain caused now by our fallenness that it's nothing like what it should have been. Nothing at all like what it was. In fact, some theologians speculate that before Adam and Eve fell, actually because we told they were naked and they were unashamed, but that they were clothed in in light in a sense. The Bible talks about a time where Moses met with God in such a powerful way that when he came down from the mountain, his face was glowing. People couldn't deal with it. He had to cover his face. Reflected radiance. Some some have speculated that Adam and Eve before the fall that that, that were clothed in light. This extraordinary glory. But we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory. And so we carry with us this kind of strange two things happening at once. No matter how badly fallen, damaged, wicked someone is, it's still the image of God. And that is why the Bible takes so seriously the taking of a human life. The taking of a human life before birth or after birth or where someone is very old and seemingly has no more, in quotes, use. The main reason why that is forbidden scripturally is because that's the image of God. You don't mess with the image of God. You don't punch someone in the face. Why? Because that's the image of God. You don't treat someone dismissively. Why? That's the image of God. Now, it's so important you understand that because people can be really annoying. (laughs) Am I right? Yeah? People can say and do terrible things, which if you don't have the fear of God in your heart, 
If you don't really understand that actually there's something that goes beyond that person's behavior towards me that makes me tremble, that even though they're acting in that way, and even though they've fallen and they're ruined, they're still the image of God. In fact, the Bible makes it clear when talking about, uh, when talking about fallen humanity, it still says still the image of God, but it's just fallen and ruined. Jesus came and Jesus said, if anyone has seen me, They've seen the Father. So he, cu- he comes as, as he come, born of a woman, t- completely human, but not fallen. No sin. Glorious. He shows us what the image of God is like, but in doing so, he also shows us what humans were made to be. At the same time, this one person with two natures, fully human, fully divine, when we see him, we see that's what we were made to be like. It's a wonderful thing. But then this one who is so beautiful and glorious and perfect is then ruined, the Bible says, more than anyone else. Beyond human likeness at the cross. Because he was going through such agony and torture on a human level, but way more than that on a spiritual level, as he's experiencing this awful sense of forsakenness and dereliction at the cross, where suddenly he's experiencing and bearing in his body all of the sins of the world in one moment. That he says he's, he's a, he's a, the Bible says he's the kind of person that you turn your face away from, you can't bear to look at. Such is the agonies that he's going through. And so this wonderful, beautiful image of God now becomes sin, the Bible says. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that in him, as we put our faith in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Extraordinary message. It's an extraordinary, it's a sublime message. If it can't make you sing, I don't know what will. It's an amazing, it's completely contrary to any other religious philosophical system which t- tries to make you find the answer within yourself, if you just empty yourself, or if you just do more, if you just, if you just adjust some things, the gospel says no. No. You may be able to improve yourself slightly. You may, be able to, you may be able to, I don't know, make some adjustments and turn over a new leaf. None of that will get you right with God. Because sin is so serious, and we're so ruined by it, that there has to be one who stands in the gap who atones for men and women. And it's Jesus at the cross. The Bible describes it as a propitiation. It's this long theological word. What does it mean? It means one who turns away the righteous and just wrath of God onto himself. And I think this is the reason why some people have trouble with God being joyful. But hold on a minute. Wrath of God? Joy? What's going on there? God is so holy. So different from you and me that he finds extraordinary delight in the most beautiful, simple, righteous things. Which is why the Bible says of us, become more like God and become more childlike. There's something so innocent and pure in the nature and the heart of God. Look at the creation around you. There's such a beautiful innocence to it. And even the repetitive nature of things, day after day. A bit like kids. Do it again. Do it again. Such a beautiful innocence, such a joy in the heart of God. But that's why he feels such wrath at sin. Because sin ruins all that is good. And because he loves what is good and he loves his creation. Sin ruins creation. He hates sin. So what do you do? You're in a dilemma. Jesus, fully God, fully man, deals with it all at the cross. Hallelujah. Deals with it. And then as we put our trust in him, The Bible says that we are born again, which means he gives us a new heart as a gift. And the Bible says something at that point begins to happen. The image that was broken at the fall begins to undergo a process of being restored in us. So what we were made to be, God goes to work on us. The Bible says that we are the workmanship of God. That word there, it denotes the idea of a work of art. We are the work. If you're a believer, you are God's work of art. He's taken you from the, you know, the, 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 the kind of the waste pile of sin and destruction and all of that. He's pulled you out, set you free from the prison of sin, set you free from the kingdom of darkness. And he said, now, like a master artist, I'm going to work on you and restore you to what you were made to be. Amen. That's the image. That's the idea. That's the gospel. That's why we're excited uh, 
One of the reasons we're excited about following the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to understand about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is really describing those attributes, those characteristics, those markers of what God and Jesus are like. Those, those qualities that are being restored in us through the work of the Holy Spirit. And you know, when you come to know Christ, you know what? He takes you on as a lifelong project. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. Completely committed to restoring you to glory. At work in you, the Bible says, to will and to work for his good pleasure. He is at work in you. And so let's look at a very famous passage on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then after that, I want to introduce you to probably a very unusual image around the fruit of the Spirit. I want to show you that it's biblical. But for some of you, you might go, what? But there we go. It will be memorable. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. So these are the things that we, that we do in our natural fallen state, the things that we get into or at least desire to do and all of that. And different ones of us will register with different ones of these. But these are, you know, sexual immorality. So sexual behavior outside of marriage. Is, that's, that's a blanket term for that. Okay? So marriage, a man and a woman together in a lifelong relationship. Sexual activity outside of that. Impurity, sensuality, so just given to following just desire, just sensual desires, regardless of whether they're right or wrong. Idolatry, worshipping other things. Sorcery, so witchcraft, which is essentially, witchcraft is about control. It's about using spells and things to try and make what you want to happen, happen. It's about controlling people and controlling situations. Control is a manifestation of witchcraft. You haven't got to be explicitly into sorcery to be living in a kind of a witchcraft vibe. It's control. Control destroys relationships. Enmity, so falling out all the time, strife, arguments, jealousy. Why can't I be like that? Why have they got that? Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And as if that's not enough, and things like these, all right? <laughs> so it's not exhaustive. You might be thinking, but my one's not there. No, but it, it's, it, things like these, all right? That's humanity. That's, that's what we are. In sin, that's where we go. That's where we go. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those... Now, please hear this. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, there it is. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived because your heart can tell you otherwise. Other people will tell you otherwise. Okay? This is the word of God. You, this, if this is your lifestyle, okay, that's the outcome. It's not the kingdom of God. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? You can't inherit the kingdom of God either by trying your hardest. It will go horribly wrong if you fall into pride. If you do well, you fall into anger if you don't. Or despair. Okay? We've already spoken about the answer. The answer is... Faith in Jesus. Simple trust in him. Turning away from all that is not centered on him and just turning to him. And experiencing the miracle of being born again. Now, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Let's read this verse together, shall we, ready? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Wow. That's what God is like when God lives in us by his Holy Spirit. That is what he is wanting to cause to grow in our lives. Now, remember what I said last week. Fruit and gifts are very different. Gifts, you just receive it. Fruit takes time to grow. I was given a lemon tree for my 50th birthday last year. Okay, I love it, but it's still a stalk and a few leaves. <laughs> All right, takes time. Takes time. Light and water, you know, Repotting at the right time, but it just there's a time process to it before it becomes fruitful. This is the this describes the ongoing journey to Christ's likeness. Now we're familiar with images, say for example, like the, the you know the vine, John fifteen. I'm the true vine. Your branches stay in me, and you'll bear much fruit. It's a very kind of straightforward idea of fruitfulness. Beautiful. We pray about it a lot. We talk about it a lot. We we love it. It's great. And it's very, very straightforward. Um, But there's another image that I think is perhaps a bit more vivid that I'm going to bring to you. We're going to start with looking in the same letter to the Galatians um, in chapter four. 
I think that's next. Is that one next, Rosalie? Yeah, thank you. He says to the church, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I'm perplexed about you. This is a very, very different idea to a vine and a branch. He's, he's, he's relating to this church as if, I mean, it's a bit of a strange image. He's in the anguish of childbirth, but then suddenly it's kind of, but Christ is being formed in them. So it's kind of unusual, but he's bringing in the metaphor, the image of Christ being formed in us. Genesis 1, what does, what does God say to Adam and Eve? Be, be what and multiply? So when the Bible talks about fruit, it does think about apples and raspberries, okay, and probably other more exotic fruits. But it also thinks about something else. It thinks about babies. Okay? Fruitfulness is a very common phrase to describe babies. Now, let's look at this. It's a really interesting passage. I think, I think could you find Ro- the Romans 7 passage, please, Rosie? Look at this. Now, I'm going to read it to you and then explain it simply, and then you're going to go, oh, right? Do you not know, brothers, I'm speaking to those who know the law. The law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband's alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another To him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. It's a marriage illustration. He's talking about he's talking about this imaginary woman. She's married to something called the law. You know, it's her husband, the law, and um, she's it's not bearing any fruit. When you when you become when you try and be a legalistic Christian, you try and just do do the right thing in your own power, it's fruitless. You just get worn out and discouraged. Okay, because it's not God's design. Okay, but he said, but there's a dilemma here because actually she can't just decide, you know, that she doesn't want to be with this husband, the law, because, you know, and go and be with someone else. She'd be an adulteress. So the solution, but the law is never going to die because the law of God, you know, every, you know, until every eye touched, every T is crossed. There's something about the, the law of God that is never going to, um, it's never going to end in that sense. What is the solution? She dies. She dies. See, the Bible says that when you're born again, you die to your old self. And that way of living, whether that's just doing your own thing or legalism, you die. And then you are, and then you are, you belong to another. You get a new husband. Him who has been raised from the dead. Who's that? It's a, it's a marriage image in order that you may bear fruit to God. So it's union. Now, let me just make it clear, in case anyone's got any bizarre ideas. Our relationship with Jesus is not sexual. I'm not teaching that. But the sexual image is being used here to describe something of the spiritual reality of our union with Christ. We are joined with him in such a way that it's like the very, the very seed of Christ comes into us and then you can go back to the Galatians picture. Paul's in labor and childbirth pains until Christ is fully formed in them. There's this picture of we are pregnant with Christ. He comes and lives in us by his spirit when we are born again. But then there's that journey of Christ being fully formed in us. Coming to, coming to a place of full grownness in us. Have you, I don't know how many of you have thought about the fruit of the spirit in that way before and i want to just show you a couple more verses just to make sure that i'm getting it right here so maybe we could look at the next one please you've been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of god another name for jesus so you've been born again the presence of jesus has come into your life the living and abiding word of god and that is as described as seed and then one other one in one john three oh. <laughs> that's all right no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed. That actual Greek word there is sperma. We get sperm from God's seed abides in him. He can't keep on sinning. He's been born of God. So when you when you are born again, spiritually speaking, you are joined to Christ 
And his seed creates this new life in you. But it's the very seed. It's is, is, is him himself. It's his presence. And so I would love us to be able to live with this image over these next few weeks as we think about growth in Christ-likeness, that Christ is being fully formed in us. And I think it's such a helpful image in a number of ways. Number one, once you're pregnant, obviously unless something goes wrong, but once you're pregnant, generally speaking, something is underway. Okay? (laughs) Something has started and it's underway. And... And there's just this thing whereby you're, you're, not, you're not making the baby grow. Okay? There's a process that is now happening that is happening to you, in you. And I think it's such a helpful way of thinking about our transformation into, the, into Christ being fully formed in us. When you are truly born again, something is happening in you and to you. The Bible says God is at work in you. A wonderful thing. How encouraging is that? Some believers get so stressed out as, as if like somehow God's forgotten them or God's not working them anymore. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Think about this image. That's a crazy idea. There's this, there's this the, the very presence of Jesus Christ growing within you. It's happening to you. It's happening in you. It's something that God himself is doing. It's something that God himself is at work in. It's not something you're doing. It's something he's doing. You're not making yourself more like Jesus. He's making you more like Jesus. Do you know that? Do you live in the good of that? Do you, do you rest in that? There's a rest. There's a rest in pregnancy. I remember when um, Davina was first pregnant with, our, with Daisy, our first child. And, um, you know, obviously we didn't know. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't know. You know, we wanted to have children, but we didn't know she was pregnant. Yeah, because uh, early, early weeks. And then I remember she came home f- from work one day, and and she ate a whole packet of pistachios <laughs> in the most, in the quickest. It was like, and then we sort of looked at each other. Arthur was like, "Wow, that was that was something." <laughs> we both noticed like it was like a, like a sort of machine. And you sort of look at each other, you know, maybe we should get a pregnancy test, you know. <laughs> Something's happening. Something's just going on. There's a passivity. Now, it's really important you understand this. I'm going to go on to something else in a moment. But it's also you understand there's a, there's a, something's happening to you. Right? God is at work in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. God is committed to you. The Bible says that God is bringing many sons to glory. Yeah, many. Just bring him to glory. He so, and the Bible says that those whom those whom he is predestined, he is called, and those whom he is called is justified, and those whom he is justified is glorified. And he talks about it in, in like all in past tense. You think, but the glorification doesn't come until right at the end. But it's that sense of no, God's I have started a work in you. I will bring it to completion. God is committed to his people. Do you know that? <laughs> Do we need to know the assurance of that because it it helps us to put off. That weird kind of uh, spiritual sort of performance where you're trying to kind of do something to make something happen. That's not how this works. He's done the work. We trust in him. Something miraculous happens in that moment of trust. We are born again by the seed of God. The seed of God is implanted in us and it grows. The, The very presence and likeness of Jesus begins to grow in us. We change. And sometimes we're amazed, even aren't we, by by the changes. You go... You, do, you hit a situation of pre- uh, pressure or stress or anxiety and you go, wow, I didn't react how I used to react. Christ is being formed in me. Someone comes at you with really negative energy and you don't bounce it straight back at them. You're able, in, by the grace of God that you can't even describe, to absorb it, take it to the cross. Find some love there and bring it back. You go, that's not me. <laughs> Something's happening in me. It's the work of God. It's the grace of God. It's, it's his commitment to us. So there's that there. But then there's another side to it that I want to refer to, which doesn't undermine that in any way. But here's the thing. As soon as you know you're pregnant, 
You know something's happening to you, but there's some choices you start to make. Glass of wine, dear? No, thanks. You know, you start reading that. What's, what, what's, what's good for the baby? It all becomes about, it all becomes about looking after the baby. There's a total commitment to what's going on. You do all you can within your power to ensure that things will go well. You, when you're doing that, you never think to yourself, oh, but I'm undermining this amazing miracle that's happening inside my body. Of course you're not. You know, no, no, of course you're not. But you're just going, no, I'm involved in this. I'm a, I'm a part of this process. I want to engage in this wholeheartedly. And when you, you know, if you sense something is wrong, or, then you know, you're, sort of, you're, you're straight down the hospital or whatever. You just, just want to have a little check. I remember, I won't say with which one, but with one of ours, Davina just, she just, she just knew um, it was time. But even though there were no signs, and so she took her suitcase to the hospital and said, I'm staying. <laughs> I'm staying. Because um, she, she knew. And sure enough, <laughs> uh, she was right. It's just, you, you, take, you take action because you care deeply about this more than anything else. Now, it's a very powerful image when you think about sanctification. Fruit of the Spirit. Becoming more like Jesus. In some mysterious way, this process that God is committed to and overseeing and outworking, he looks for and hopes for our very, very meaningful cooperation with him. Because if you neglect that, if that doesn't become, uh, if, 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 if just the, the, the glory of Christ and the purposes of God, if they're not your real, your one thing as a believer, something's wrong. I've got to say that. Something's wrong. If, that's, if, if he's not your first love, like, something's really wrong there. It, 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 it would be like, you know, if, if, if a woman that was pregnant just didn't, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, but if, if the glass of wine would be all right. Yeah, it's all right. So you'd be more careful. And so there's a care that's required in our walk with God. Because Christ is being formed in us. The image of Jesus is growing in us. And so it, does, it matters. It matters what we do, how we live. It matters the choices that we make. Of course it does. Why? Because God is at work in us. Because, not to make God, but no, because God is at work in us. That's the most important thing. It's our delight and our wonder. And we just, we just want to know Jesus more. And it becomes, that becomes the thing that, that catches us up. You see, that's the most natural thing in the world. And like I said, it's, it's a completely different dynamic from gi- being given a spiritual gift. Bang, there you go, you got it. Okay, great. You can speak in tongues. You can prophesy. You can do the. That's just, just gifts. This is a process that's very different from that. But actually, the two are connected because here's the thing. And just think about this for a moment. The gifts that God gives us to use are just given as gifts, right? But imagine I get given the gift of prophecy, right? But I'm being careless in the area of Christ being formed in me. Yeah, and I'm not letting him work his patience and gentleness into my life. Then the way that gift manifests is going to be harsh and impatient. You see that? Still a gift of the Holy Spirit. May well be accurate and right, but that person I'm prophesying over is not being served well. You see, because who we are and how we are with others, our love for God, our love for one another, our love for the lost, all of that is, that's more the, that's more the fruit side of things. And so there's a process of, for us to be deeply engaged in and deeply involved in and as we do so. As we do so, we can be confident that we are being responsible with this amazing gift that has been given to us. The presence of Jesus Christ growing inside of us. Let's pray. Let's just be before the Lord. Open our hearts to him. God's plan for the world is still people in his image filled with his spirit. And so this allowing Christ to be formed in us, it's not a selfish thing. 
to be a person of love, such a massive impact. To be a person of holy joy, amazingly powerful. There's not much of that about. To be a person of peace in a culture riddled with anxiety, riddled with it. That's a very, very, very powerful testimony. To be someone who loves goodness, who doesn't, doesn't do what everyone else is doing and call good evil and evil good, but you call good good and evil evil. That's powerful. To be someone gentle, meek, not, not railroading yourself into people's lives, but meek. To be someone faithful. You promised you'd do it, so you do it. You're there when you said you'd be. You're not flick flacking all the time. You're faithful. To be someone who's able to control themselves. This is all this is supernatural stuff. It's what Jesus was like. And Lord, I just want to pray for us as a church. That as we have the joy over these next few weeks of thinking about these amazing themes of love and joy and peace, really digging into these amazing attributes of what you're like and what you are forming in us, your presence forming in us. I want to pray that there will just be a grace on us as a church. An excitement, a sense of, "Ah, I'm pregnant. Right, right, wow, okay, what are we going to do? Something's... God is at work in me. What are we going to do? Okay, what, what does it look like to really care for and nurture this precious new life? This presence of Jesus in my heart. What does that look like? That it's not weird or oddly radical to do that. It's just the most reasonable thing in the world. I've got this new life growing in me. I care about it. And that, Lord, that you would see that response from us and that we would, it would please your heart. It please your heart. I pray for us, Lord. And then I want to finish by just praying for those for whom, as you read that list of the fruit of the Spirit, there's maybe one or two in that list and you just think, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Either because of your own family you know, just the, the characteristics that you've been brought up with is all you've ever known. You know, we've ever known is outbursts of anger or we've ever known is control or, you know, we've ever known is mis- mis- being miserable and negative and critical. You think, oh, wow, it just feels daunting. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus redeems us from things we've inherited from our families that aren't any good. How amazing is that? And we just declare and proclaim your blood over our lives, Lord. That we will not be held captive by certain things just because our mum or our dad was or our grandma or our granddad was or it's always been that way. But we thank you that something new happens in Christ. That if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And I pray for faith to grow in our hearts around that, Lord. That we would say, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I'm not going to just capitulate to the natural pattern of things. I'm not going to let the enemy lie to me and keep me in some sort of bondage to things. Just, just think away. It's always it's just how it's going to be. But there is, there is one growing in us who is above all and who cannot be stopped. And I pray, oh God, for if people have got discouraged or kind of set in their ways on this and they've sort of lost a sense of hope, hopefulness or Faith, I want to ask that you would deliver them from that in the name of Jesus. That you would destroy that stronghold, that lofty argument raised against you in their mind. You would knock it down, Lord, with a gift of faith. <laughs> just do, we just pray now in the name of Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you go to work in strongholds of the mind, lofty opinions and arguments, saying things contrary to what you say. They would come down. And they would submit to the liberating truth of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.